Hello there, friends. This is Spencer Michelle, and welcome to your weekly forecast for the week of December 2nd through December 8th. I apologize for getting this out a little bit late this week. Um, hope that you all had a good holiday weekend or Thanksgiving or however you celebrate. Uh, had a little bit of a, a family emergency with a sick, a sick pet. I had a cat that um, swallowed a chunk of plastic from a toy and um, needed some monitoring for a few days and some medical attention. Uh, he's okay now. He, he weathered the storm, um, but it's been a, a long few days and we're, you know, kind of getting caught up here. So I appreciate your patience with that and we'll, we'll uh, do the best we can with the, the week ahead here. Um, there is a very big planetary shift this week with Jupiter moving into uh, Capricorn and the domicile of Saturn. So that is our big news of the week. We're going to be talking about that um, for quite a bit of time in our video here. Um, we'll talk about the essential dignity report. We've got a number of non-lunar aspects as well, including Mercury sextiling um, Pluto on Tuesday and Mercury, um, I'm sorry, Venus sextiling Mars the same day. Uh, on Wednesday, we will be experiencing the first quarter moon. And then at the end of the week on Sunday, we have a couple of aspects with Neptune, with the sun squaring Neptune and Venus making a sextile to Neptune as well. So that's kind of the overview of the week ahead. Um, we will dive right in. All right. So essential dignities for the week. Um, we have the sun moving through Sagittarius, the second decan, where it has rulership uh, by triplicity during the daytime. Um, this is also where the sun is in the terms of Jupiter from 0 to 12 degrees, and then the terms of Venus from 12, I believe, to 17 degrees. Excuse me. So the, remember, the terms were what uh, the type of etiquette required from a planet or the sort of the curriculum that that planet is following. So we're going to be moving from the, uh, the rules being made by the greater benefic of Jupiter to the lesser benefic of Venus throughout, throughout the week here. Uh, Jupiter itself is going to be losing dignity uh, going from its home domicile of Sagittarius and going into its, its fall or basically a condition where it is debilitated or at the bottom of the wheel of fortune um, as early as uh, Monday. Uh, I'm recording this Monday morning and then Jupiter is about to switch, switch signs here. Uh, Jupiter does have a little bit of dignity in the first face or the first decan of Capricorn. So that's something where that there will be some support for Jupiter. So it's not devoid of, of any dignity. Um, it will have some ability to do the things that it wants to do, um, but it will not be probably as strong as it was when it was in Sagittarius. It'll be just a, a whole different vibe. Uh, it'll be having resources provided for it by Saturn instead of having all access to all of its own resources in its own temple. And that is a very different type of energy than um, the expansive quality of Sagittarius and Jupiter, uh, rather than being more restrictive and, and working within limitations with, with um, having Saturnian resources. So like I said, we'll explore that further. Saturn itself is going to be moving through the second decan of Capricorn, which is its home domicile. It will be in the terms of Venus uh, for the week. Uh, it doesn't move very fast, so it's been hanging out there for a little while. Um, but, you know, Capricorn is a, is a place that Saturn feels very comfortable in and is able to do the things that it wants to do, like set healthy boundaries and limitations, um, set long-term plans, and, and make slow and steady progress, or let go of the things that need to be let go of and do the, the hard work necessary to, to enact um, the dream or to uh, live life, basically, uh, the necessities of life. Uh, th those are the things associated with, with Saturn. And, uh, you know, when it's in Capricorn, it's much easier to kind of suck it up and do what you got to do. All right. Uh, Venus is going to be also moving through the first and second decans of Capricorn for the week where it has triplicity rulership by the daytime. Venus was the daytime ruler of the earth signs. So this is a, a condition where it has a little bit of support from its community. So there's some uh, Venusian communal support happening in our lives in the Capricorn area of our chart. Venus is going to be moving through the same sign as, as Saturn and Pluto in the south node. So there's some 
you know, heavy relationship stuff that may be going on for the month ahead, uh, where Venus is going to be being sub, sub, subjected to all of that very intense um, <laughs> kind of, you have to, you may not want to do it, but you have to do it kind of energy that we had that was very prominent in the summertime when we had all the um, eclipses and all the planets were opposing, all of those planets are going through the, the gauntlet or the meat grinder, so to speak. And now Venus is kind of moving through that territory herself, um, you know, maybe letting go of some things that she doesn't need, or, you know, maybe promoting harmonious change through a little bit of austerity or through, uh, you know, tightening the purse strings a little bit, maybe pruning the budget. Uh, this is something I've been going through lately is pruning, pruning the budget of, of unnecessary things so that we can move forward with the things that really do serve us. Uh, so, so that may be something we're experiencing with Venus. Um, Venus is going to be uh, in the terms of Jupiter in the beginning of the week and then moving into the terms of Venus from 15 degrees to 22 degrees where it will be in its own terms. So that's a condition where it kind of sets its own rules and sets its own curriculum. So towards the end of the week, Venus will get a little bit happier and have a little bit more agency to do the types of things that it wants to do. Uh, clean things up, clean up messes, um, create uh, harmonious uh, agreements between folks, uh, beautify environments, perhaps beautifying things that have gotten uh, overrun with corruption or decay. Uh, when a planet is in Saturn's sign, there may be some, some contact with uh, things that are old, things that need to be renewed, or uh, things that need to be preserved. So there may be something in your life where you're trying to preserve something old, or you're trying to get rid of the decay of something that is no longer serving you. And Venus is going to be empowered towards the end of the week to, to do that a little bit more effectively. All right. Mars is still moving through the first decade of Scorpio, where it has a lot of power. Uh, it is in its own domicile. It's in a, its uh, um, nocturnal temple, uh, its feminine temple of Scorpio. Uh, it is also in its own face or decade in the first 10 degrees. And it's in the terms of Venus from degrees 7 to 11. So it has, has quite a bit of dignity. Um, this is a good time to sustain our willpower or our forward energy. Uh, this is another thing that is supportive of uh, cutting and severing from things that no longer serve us. And with Mars in a sign that it, it enjoys being in, those efforts may be a little bit more direct, a little bit more... Um, effective, a little bit more in our best interest rather than, you know, in the last month or so uh, when Mars was moving through Libra, where it, it was creating havoc in an in a area of our life that it may not have been appropriate, like our relationships or areas where harmony was required or where grace was required. And we may have been creating conflict there rather than getting rid of the things that needed to be gotten rid of. Uh, in Scorpio, uh, a sign that is more associated with, you know, the late fall and with uh, the leaves falling off the trees in the northern hemisphere, with everything going internalized and, and um, you know, the end of the harvest season, we can see that Mars may be more, more effective in that uh, circumstance where we're needing to let go of things, where we're needing to consolidate, where we're needing to uh, come to terms with severing and death and the end of a cycle. Uh, so these are things that may be supported for you this week with Mars being uh, in pretty good shape. Now, remember, I think it's important to remember this, that each of the planets can only really be its own essential self. So Mars is still Mars. Mars is still what they considered a malefic planet or one that uh, it was ne not necessarily bringing us the good things in life that we subjectively like as human beings. doesn't mean it can have good effects. Uh, I, one of the experts on ancient astrology that I, I like to listen to, um, who recently passed, but he, he has some really great lectures out there named Robert Schmidt. Um, he, he speaks a lot about uh, malefics or benefics becoming either functionally benefic or functionally malefic based on their condition. And you know what that means is that a planet can basically, uh, instead of bringing just negative circumstance and negative fortune could bring us things that we you know subjectively like uh in a in a malefics case it can become functionally benefic where we may benefit but from the misfortunes of others uh 
there are certain circumstances where a, a malefic planet can become fully benefic, uh, according to Schmidt, where um, we may be able to benefit, um, but not through the misfortune of others. But a malefic planet can never become, uh, I believe the word is benevolent, uh, which means that that good will spill out onto others as well. So we might not, you know, if a, if a malefic in good shape can, can become uh, functional, we may not necessarily have to have others suffer so that we benefit, but it's, it's not, the circumstances we encounter might not be uh, in everyone's best interest pouring out like a benefic could be if it is in good shape or good condition, where that good could not only benefit us, but spill out to everyone around us. Um, same thing with a, um, with a benefic. A benefic can become functionally malefic, but it can never become malevolent. Malevolent is when a, a planet uh, does harm to us, and then that harm can spill out to others. So when a benefic planet becomes functionally malefic, I know this is a lot of, we're going around in circles with those words, but uh, it, it's important to make these distinctions, I think, because we have a planet like Jupiter that's in its fall, uh, and that planet could potentially become um, functionally malefic in some of our charts, uh, where we may be um, experiencing hardship, and we may be able to benefit others, but through our own hardship. That's really what it means to be functionally malefic, where you know we may be doing some kind of action where we may subjectively feel like we're, you know suffering on some level, but that may be benefiting others. So others benefit at our expense type of experience. But it, it says that benefic planets, Jupiter and Venus, can never become malevolent where they're actively harming others. Uh, so an important distinction to make, and I think one that was really interesting and something that I've done um, some research in with my own chart and with, with some of my clients' charts to kind of test out the theory. And I've definitely seen that, that play out um, talking to clients and, and with my own experience with my out of sect benefic planets and 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 so on and so forth, um, I, I can I can see the connections with that 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 may have some some truth bearing out to it. Okay, so a little malefic benefic type of mini lesson there. Moving on to Mercury, Mercury is moving through the third decan of Scorpio, where it uh, is peregrine. Uh, peregrine meaning it is a wandering star where it does not have any essential dignity. It's kind of a traveler. Um, it's not in, the, not in the greatest shape. It's just kind of hanging out. It doesn't have any essential dignity or debility. It's, it's, but this was not an, a condition that was um, very uh, desirable in the ancient world because as a traveler, you are vulnerable to, um, you know, I don't know, thieves or uh, the unknown, so to speak. So Mercury, not super happy, but Mercury is still in the terms of Jupiter for the first uh, part of the week and then moves into the terms of Saturn towards the end of the week. So remember, when we talked about having a benefic planet like Jupiter or Venus as a bound lord, uh, that teacher may be a little bit more lenient, whereas when a planet moves into the terms of a malefic planet like Saturn or Mars, we have a little bit of a stricter teacher where if we make a mistake or we have to follow a protocol that's a little bit more severe. So be careful with your communications this week because they, um, they may not be as uh, functional as they normally would be if, if Mercury had some more dignity. Um, the only good thing I could say about it is Mercury is hanging out with its host. It's hanging out with Mars in Scorpio, so it does have access to its it's the resources of Mars by being by by the essence of being in the same temple with it. So the, this is a time where Mercury can can um, perhaps we can have the difficult conversations, you know, where we can and our conversations could lead to some kind of cutting or severing or exertion of our own will. Maybe we have a necessary argument that we need to have. Uh, it may be a little bit more. Uh, lenient in the beginning of the week when it's in the terms of Jupiter, and we may have to have a, a much tougher conversation by the end of the week when Mercury moves into the bound or the terms of Saturn, where we need to, you know, maybe set a boundary um, and say, and draw a line and say, no, this is, this is my boundary and, and we're not going to cross it anymore. 
Um, and really pay attention to the Scorpio ruled area of your chart, whatever house Scorpio falls in in your chart. That, that's a, a, a very ripe um, place for this energy to play out in. Okay, so moving on to the moon, we have four moon signs to get through this week. We're, of course, building up to this first quarter moon, which is when we have a square between the sun and the moon. And that's going to happen around Wednesday. So we're building up to that with a crescent phase. And the moon's moving through uh, Aquarius, where it has dignity in the third phase, 20 to 30 degrees of Aquarius. So there's a little bit of dignity there. Although there's some debate. I was reading, in doing some research for this week ahead, I was reading a book by an ancient author named Firmicus Maternus, which is pretty good stuff. And uh, he was mentioning essential dignity and saying that when planets are in their own decan, or when they're in their own bound, it's similar to a planet being in its own domicile. So this is one ancient author that wasn't necessarily making a distinction on whether it was better if uh, a planet was in domicile or bound or face. Um, he was saying it was similar. So I thought that was something interesting and worth exploring. I know in the, the medieval system, we have like a scoring system where we give five points for a planet being in its own domicile or its own temple, uh, four points for exaltation, and so on and so forth down the line. Um, whereas a planet being its own decan was much a much weaker dignity than being in domicile. And I'm not exactly sure the Hellenistic authors felt that way. Uh, I can't be 100% sure, uh, but I but seeing one particular author offering up uh, sort of a different opinion on that makes me think that it's worth doing more research and saying, well, maybe it's a different type of dignity, not necessarily one that is uh, stronger or weaker. Remember, when we're di distinguishing between these, um, one of the authors that I really like, Demetra George, talks about domicile, you know, being um, a, a planet staying at the estate or manor of another planet, or, or if it's in its own estate or manner. It's not just a temple. It's like um, they thought of these as like, uh, think about in, in medieval times where you were, there was a, a house uh, and a, a lord or an, of an estate, and it was a, a land that people lived on and they could, you know, have access to the, to the lord of the manor or something like that, um, where there, there's resources. They're, they have access to the gardens. They have access to the to the, the guest house or whatever it is, um, or to their own house, basically, if they're in domicile. Um, when a planet was in triplicity, that was said to be having communal support or having the wind at its sails, because it was associated with the, uh, the elemental winds or the directional winds. Um, so kind of a boost of energy that is pushing you in the right direction. Like we said, we have Venus having triplicity rulership this, uh, this week. Uh, the sun also having triplicity rulership. So those two planets are having some communal support. Um, and the bounds being, you know, being able to, to work within a, a curriculum or, or within certain limitations that are set by a particular planet. Um, so really, really just very interesting ways of thinking about the different, the different dignities. Exaltations, um, being honored, you know, having the honor of your, of, of your peers or the esteem of your <clears throat> of your, oh, I don't know, potentially of your family or people that you share a community with or things like that, um, where you are uh, at the top of the wheel of fortune, where you're kind of uh, at a position of, of power because you uh, are in fortunate circumstances. Okay, so we were getting through the moon, the moon going through Aquarius in the beginning of the week where it has dignity by face. Uh, the moon will move through Pisces, where it has is the cooperating triplicity ruler. Um, I'm not exactly sure how that works as far as uh, empowering a planet. Um, my understanding of cooperating triplicity rulership is a lot of it was used to delineate different house topics based on the different triplicity rulers. I, I believe there was a, a good lecture from a very good astrologer named Jen Zart um, who, who spoke on this. Uh, which is worth exploring if you want to know more about that. I believe they divided up different parts of the house um, based on the, which triplicity ruler was where and the condition of it. Um, so like, for example, um, 
siblings. I know I've talked about this in the past, but one one triplicity ruler could rule your uh, older siblings. One could rule your younger siblings, and another one could could rule messengers or something like that, which is another third house or neighbors or something of that nature. Um, so, something to explore with that if you're if you're interested in pursuing that further. When the moon moves into Aries, it will be Peregrine, again, the wandering star, uh, where it is a stranger in a strange land and it doesn't have any essential dignity. And then at the very end of the week, the moon will move into its exaltation uh, in Taurus, where it will have rulership uh, by triplicity in the nighttime and, of course, be uh, honored by being in its, in its exalted state. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on this week as well. All right. So let's take a look here at our weekly forecast. Now, one thing I wanted to talk about first, I'll share my screen, is we see on Monday, this is Monday here, that Jupiter, the greater benefic, uh, has moved or will be moving as I'm making this video here basically. Uh, it's gonna change signs about five minutes, so maybe you'll sense a different vibe uh, as I'm making the video here in real time. Um, you can see now, here's now, 29 degrees in the very, very end here, and it'll be switching over in about five minutes. Uh, so Jupiter in Capricorn. Let's just move it over here. There we go. So let's take a look at the meanings of Jupiter, the meanings of Saturn, and how the Jupiterian influence or the jovial influence may be functioning within a much different environment than uh, it was when it was in its home estate or home temple of Sagittarius. Now, from my experience or from my learning, I think that when we look at Jupiter and Sagittarius, uh, you can think of, I like the metaphor of Santa Claus. I, I've heard people describe Jupiter as Santa Claus, you know, this big jovial jolly figure who's giving gifts to people uh who is you know a traveler um around the world a world traveler uh he is associated with abundance with bringing uh things that people bringing people joy and people and and things that they love um now i had a thought about jupiter and capricorn uh being like the the bad santa or like the uh I don't, know if you, I don't know if any of you have seen that, that movie with uh, Billy Bob Thornton where he's kind of like this con artist and uh, you know, goes around malls like manipulating people through his, his mall Santa persona. Um, so this could be one manifestation where we have uh, you know, somebody who is appearing as somebody who may be uh, trying to be helpful, but maybe they have ulterior motives. Um, or we could think of like, I also was thinking maybe this could be like the, uh, the, the Santa that is represented, you know, some, a homeless guy on the street that's in a Santa costume who's pretty disheveled and in bad shape. Uh, <laughs> this could be another one. Another one I saw today that I really actually really liked was a, a comparison um, of Norman Rockwell's Santa Claus and then his portrayal of Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and of course, Benjamin Franklin associated with thrift, uh, with economy. Um, I believe he wrote the Poor Richard's Almanac, where he had things to share and things to to um, bestow on people. But it was through a little bit more austerity. It was through the uh, the virtues of hard work, uh, the virtues of um, perhaps getting in touch with humility, uh, with getting by with less. I think that this is something where we are, Saturn is going to be providing the resources for Jupiter to work with. Now, that doesn't mean that Jupiter can't do good in Capricorn. It is in its fall, okay? So when we talk about a planet being in its fall, it's at the bottom of the wheel of fortune. It's kind of starting from a lowly position. Uh, if you think about Jupiter in um, its exaltation of cancer. Uh, an interesting thing about that is Jupiter was also associated in the ancient world with, with uh, begetting children, with fertility, and cancer being a very fertile sign in the, in the height of summer where everything is growing and abundant, everything is flowering. 
um, you can see there's a natural affinity with the with that planet and that sign. It's kind of like Jupiter is like, you know, got everything it needs to just create abundance and birth. Every you know, there's um, you know, baby birds being born, animals are you know nurturing uh, their young and things like that. And this is another thing about uh, Jupiter. Now, when we get to the opposite end of the spectrum, when we're closing in on the winter solstice where everything is kind of uh, consolidating and going back into itself, Jupiter may have a little bit more uh, of a challenge working through those circumstances. Jupiter wants to create expansion and growth and abundance, but in the uh, winter sign of Capricorn, there is a prevailing uh, environment of, uh, of lack, of um, scarcity perhaps, of working within uh, more limited means. And, and that's, I think that is where we are seeing Jupiter being in its fall. It's, it's really not, uh, it, it doesn't have all the things that it needs to, to work through its essential nature. It has to work through the, basically the, with the resources of Saturn, which are the res- what are the resources of Saturn? Death, decay, limitation, boundaries okay so when you put a a planet associated with expansion in a planet in a domicile that's ruled by a planet associated with limitation then we get jupiter and capricorn um does not mean that we can't still expand it just means that our progress may start to slow down saturn is a very slow planet uh it, it requires daily focus it requires slow patient planned out growth. Uh, and this may be the path to our goals with Jupiter and Capricorn for the next year. It's going to be there until December 19th of 2020. Uh, so very interesting times that we're working through here. And let's take a look before we move forward. Um, I'm going to stop my share for a minute. I want to show you the, the three cards of, of Capricorn here. Because this is going to be a journey that we're going on with, with Jupiter and Capricorn. And we're looking at the two, three, and four of pentacles. And we're starting out this week, literally right now as I'm speaking, with Jupiter moving into Capricorn 1, which is associated with the two of pentacles. It will subsequently move through Capricorn 2, or 10 to 20 degrees of Capricorn, which is the three of pentacles. And then Capricorn 3, which is associated with the Four of Pentacles. And here we see in the first decan a figure that is juggling uh, two pentacles with ships on a stormy or wavy sea behind him. And we talked about this when Venus was changing signs, but this is about the, this first decan is about where do we want to put our roots down? Where do we want to um, build our empire, so to speak? Uh, in the second decan, you can see people cooperating in, in, with a blueprint to build an ornate structure. And then in the third decan here, we see a figure with four pentacles holding on very tightly with uh, lots of structures behind him. Perhaps he has, he has attained the material power that he was uh, working in or working towards in the, first two, uh, in the first two cards. So we have this kind of like deciding what we want to build and where we want to build it. We've got the work that is going to be done to actually manifest it into reality and into physical form. Remember, Capricorn is a cardinal earth sign, so we're trying to bring something into form on the material realm, which takes time. We are, we're subject to the laws of space and time when we are working within material form, so we have to play by the rules of time. Okay? And then we, eventually, we may get to the point where we are manifesting those things into form. Now, things to be careful of, things to be careful of. We have to be careful of getting a little bit too ambitious materially when we have Jupiter and Capricorn where we're attached to the physical form of things instead of the idealism of of Sagittarius and doing things because it's, quote unquote, the right thing to do or or following a dream. We may be following um, the physical manifestation of that dream. And we have to be very careful that it's the right one because if we're following just uh, how something is manifesting into form, we may get attached to the form of it rather than the ideal that was driving it. And that, I think that's one of the things that we can come into contact with with Jupiter and Capricorn is 
we may it's very easy to get blinded by the uh, the vehicle that that something is is moving through, and we need to really pay attention throughout this cycle of are we still connected to the essence behind that dream that we're pursuing, or are we getting you know maybe a little bit caught up in in what it looks like and what how it appears to others through its its physical manifestation. All right. Um, now, Jupiter is the decanic ruler of the first decan of Capricorn, so it does have some dignity by face. Uh, so it, it is not completely devoid of dignity. There is, it does have some support um, by be, having rulership of, of its own decan there. Uh, we are also going to be experiencing through the first decan uh, some luck potentially with changing our circumstances. This card right here, the two of pentacles, was called change or harmonious change um, by Book T or the Book of Toth. And we're thinking about uh, how do we maybe potentially change locales to be able to build whatever structures that we are envisioning. So this may be a really great time to think about and weigh your different options uh, through the next month or so, through when Jupiter's moving through the first deck in the next month or two, okay? It's going to be there for a year. It's going to, there's a retrograde cycle in there. So, um, you know, we, we have some time to figure this out. But in the next few weeks, let's just start with the, the moment, the practical moment here. There's going to be probably some opportunities for you in the Capricorn area of your chart uh, where you need to decide what where the best place would be, where the best locale or where the best dream to start building some sort of material structure would be. And it, there may be some indecisiveness associated with that. Uh, a lot of times when we have different options, uh, there's many different factors involved and we have to take into account not just our own needs and desires, but those of, of our community, of those that we serve, of potentially the people in our family, uh, of the people that we are in relationship with. All of those things are factors. So these are themes that may be coming up in the, in the beginning of the month here. And especially as Jupiter moves into a trine with Uranus, there may be, it may be a good time to break free of some restrictive surroundings and move towards something that may have more benefit. Uh, that Jupiter-Uranus trine is going to be uh, perfecting next week. So, but we are going to start feeling it as we move into Jupiter and Capricorn here today. Um, all right, let's see. One of the other themes of Jupiter and Capricorn is expansion through necessity. This is one of the words associated with Saturn, uh, Ananke, necessity. So, excuse me, what does necessity mean? Well, Necessity is the things that we may have to do that we may not want to do. And this is where the, the qualities of hard work come in, where we're grinding it out, where we're needing to quote unquote Saturn up a little bit. Um, and this is where you just have to show up every day and do the work that you need to do. It may not be glamorous. It may not be fun, but it may be necessary. And th this is how we're going to achieve the dream now is through just slow, patient, practical, uh, consistent effort towards what we need to do. Uh, now, my teacher, Adam Almas, has some really great Jupiter and Capricorn videos and, and um, podcasts as well that I recommend that you check out. Also, he's doing his fundraiser for the year, so um, he does a lot of great work. So if you want to support him, he has a Kickstarter going on. I'll give him a shout out here. Uh, but he talks about... Um, not committing to a goal that that uh, is not in alignment with your integrity as well. So it could be easy to to commit to something that looks good on the on the surface, but but may not be in your best interest in the long term. So this is something to think about as well. All right. Um, I think another th potential with Jupiter and Capricorn is we may feel a little bit of a. Uh, a damper on our enthusiasm. Jupiter was associated with optimism, with hope, with, uh, with motion. Uh, it was a fire, it's a fiery planet, right? It's at its home 
uh, it, it has been at home in the in the fire sign of Sagittarius. It of course does have rulership in the water sign of Pisces too, and it's in its more feminine expression. But in its masculine expression, it's very active. It's very fiery. It's very expansive, optimistic, hopeful. And when uh, uh, the very a very hopeful planet moves into the sign Saturn. Saturn is a planet that it generally is not associated with hope. It's associated with pessimism, with depression, uh, with uh, a practicality where we are, you know, setting these limitations for ourselves. And so some of our enthusiasm may be dampered. And this is, this is normal, though. Think about how your life has gone in the past where you get an idea. And at the beginning of that idea, you get really fired up about it. This is kind of how, I, you know, this is how I work through things. This may not be your experience, but this may, I'm hoping that this is a, a universal human experience where you get really excited about an idea and then you come face to face with what, what reality needs to take place, what practical, tangible things need to take place to turn that into some sort of material form. And this is what we're experiencing now. We're experiencing the, the, ne the necessity to say, well, we have this dream, uh, what actually needs to take place? How much is it going to cost? What kind of resources are we going to need? What kind of sacrifices are we going to have to make on the daily basis to turn it into, uh, you know, some kind of manifestation? And every once in a while, that can throw a little cold water on the, on the dream because we may, uh, the difference between what we are visualizing, and remember, uh, all of these Sagittarian placements, including Jupiter, have been squaring Neptune you know, giving us a little bit of a, you know, perhaps a bloated dream or perhaps a, a, a dream that is coming in contact with a little bit of idealization or illusion. And now we're maybe getting a little bit more, uh, more of the reality check of what that dream actually would feel like if it was brought into form. And sometimes those two things don't always match up. And that can be a little bit frustrating. That can be disappointing. And that may be part of the things that could lead to some of the uh, pessimism that we may be experiencing. And I think that the, the key with that is to push through it and to be constantly reevaluating whether what you're doing is, is in your best interest or is what you want. Um, I think if you're able to be honest with yourself and not get too stubbornly fixated on what, it, what the form of it looks like and stay in touch with the essence of it, that will, I think, will be your best friend throughout this cycle. Okay. Getting a pretty good idea of Jupiter and Capricorn. Uh, we'll be talking about this for the next year. So this is just kind of an introduction with that. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a shift. I mean, the, the planets keep on moving and the wheel keeps on spinning. So there's going to be times where we feel really optimistic and hopeful. There are going to be times where, you know, we're a little bit uh, at the bottom of the wheel and we feel a little more down and depressed. And we can choose to learn from both of those. We can ch choose the, the, the middle way where we don't get too high with the highs and we don't get too low with the lows. And I think that uh, sometimes we learn the most through our limitations as well. I know this is something that I've been experiencing in the last uh, weeks and months is uh, the having a, an expansive vision and then coming in contact with the reality and what is necessary to, to make it a reality. And yes, that can be painful. Um, but I, I really do think we learn some of the best things through through the painful experiences as well as through the joyful ones. So try to try to embrace the the pain or embrace the limits and be thankful for them uh, throughout this cycle as well. All right, let's move on to Tuesday. Tuesday, the moon is moving through Pisces and it's going to be in its crescent phase, which is a, a waxing moon where it is gaining in light. We had our new moon last week and now we are trying to mobilize the resources necessary to make whatever new hopeful um, dream that we may have planted in the Sagittarian area of our chart a reality. So this is the time where we're just kind of figuring out all the details. We're trying to you know, get past the inertia that we may be experiencing and move more towards uh, manifestation. Mercury will be making a sextile to Pluto at 12, 19 a.m., so very early in the morning on Tuesday on the East Coast. So we may be feeling that on a late Monday where we're really trying to penetrate into the, the details of something and, and figure out what is lying underneath the surface. So we may have some deep conversations. Uh, Mercury is moving through Scorpio. You may have a detective-like energy where you are trying to really see the under 
the underpinnings of the structures that you're working within with with Pluto in Capricorn. So this is kind of like looking beneath the surface of things to find out the reality of it, to, to how are we going to move forward? What resources do we really need? Be careful of, of getting too obsessed with your thoughts. This could, you know, Mercury, Pluto combinations can lead to a little bit of obsessive thinking, um, a little bit of mental fixation on things. So that is one thing to, to watch out for. It also could be a regenerative aspect where maybe we have a new insight and we're able to let go of some old thoughts and really like get out of a fixed position that we were in and maybe see some new uh, opportunities or new insights or new new ways of manifesting the dream that we maybe didn't think of before because we weren't willing to to let go of an old thing that we are holding on to. Uh, so that's something we're experiencing on Tuesday, the, the third. Um, the moon will be making a sextile uh, to Jupiter, newly ingressed into Capricorn at 2.35 um, a.m. on Tuesday, very early in the morning. So this is our first lunar contact with Jupiter and Capricorn. So that'll be interesting to see what that triggers. Uh, take a look at the Pisces area of your chart and see if there's something that's being brought into harmony with the Capricorn ruled area of your chart, uh, because those two things will be related on Tuesday. The moon will also be making a supportive sextile to Uranus at the same, around uh, a few hours later at 8.43 a.m. at three degrees of Pisces and Capricorn. So whatever insights we may have gathered from the Mercury-Pluto sextile and then the you know ability to, to put those things into action with the sextile to Jupiter, uh, they may be creating some kind of new liberating influence when the moon is making a positive contact to Uranus in Taurus. Okay. Um, and this is going to be activating that, that Jupiter-Uranus trine that is already uh, starting because of Jupiter and Uranus making or witnessing each other, making an aspect by whole sign. Now, that's going to increase in its uh, potency as it moves into a, a, um, a connection, okay? Uh, when they're aspects, it's called a connection, which is a three within three-degree orb. Calasis is when they are in conjunction with one another within three degrees. Uh, so we're going to be seeing an intensification of that Jupiter-Uranus energy as we move towards next week, but we may be seeing kind of the, the, the new impulses starting this week as those two planets are, are witnessing one another uh, through their, their earthly signs. Venus will be making a sextile to Mars from Capricorn at nine degrees to uh, the domicile of Scorpio. So this combination... Uh, really increases our our desire nature. Uh, it could be associated with, excuse me, being a little bit lusty. This is the combination of Aphrodite and Ares, uh, the goddess of love and the god of war. So, <laughs> like, I don't know if it's the make love, not war, or make love and war. It may be one of those types of things. Um, so there's a there's a masculine feminine balance here where you know Venus wants to receive and and it doesn't necessarily um, pursue what it wants. It lets things come to her, whereas Mars is a pursuer. So we may be seeing the, the combination of things that we're pursuing and, and our receptive nature, um, providing some kind of fertile ground with these two planets being in, in positive communication with one another through the, uh, through the harmonious aspect of the sextile, which remember sextiles are of the nature of Venus um, because of their relationship in the natal chart of the world, the Thema Mundi. Um, so we've talked about that in previous videos, so check those out if you want to get more insight into that. All right. Um, yeah, this could be a little bit more about uh, a physical expression of, of love, of art. Um, this could be something where we're just really kind of bringing things into form uh, through our will uh, and, you know, finding a, uh, some interlocking pieces, so to speak. All right, through the evening, we are going to see a trine from the moon to Mars. So from nine degrees Pisces to uh, nine degrees Scorpio. And this is happening around a similar time frame. And then we are having a sextile with the moon to Venus at 1026 p.m. Okay, so the moon is going to be assisting with this kind of marriage between Venus and Mars. All right. 
Moving on to Wednesday. On Wednesday, we begin. Actually, let me. I haven't been sharing my screen here. Be ba doo bap boop ba day. All right, there we go. On Wednesday, so we'll see here. Monday, there's Jupiter and Capricorn. Tuesday, we see the relationship between Venus and Mars, and then the Moon making contact between one and then another. Okay, so it's kind of like they're he's he's intermediating and and helping to soothe that connection so to speak or bring it into manifestation remember the moon is like a a trigger like a music box trigger where it's it's sounding the tuned keys of those planetary energies um as we move into wednesday the fourth we're going to be moving into the first quarter phase so you can see here first quarter is when the moon comes into a 90 degree square with the sun. So this is a, a one of the uh, important points in the fourfold division of the lunar cycle. The first one being the new moon where we planted the karmic seed. Uh, and this next one being a point where we've been gaining in light and we meet some kind of uh, externalized crisis or some kind of um, friction point, some kind of conflict that we have to work through to, to move towards the manifestation that we've been trying to trying to bring into being. So that's going to be happening very early in the morning on Wednesday the 4th. Uh, and this is between two Jupiter-ruled signs. So this may be something where uh, related to the dream that we're trying to manifest. And Jupiter is now providing resources for both the sun and the moon. And one of the things that we're going to be seeing in this relationship here is instead of now Jupiter being at the, uh, uh, or the sun being at the table, or in the, the estate or the domicile of Jupiter, with its host present, now it's in this condition called aversion, okay, where, where it does not see or aspect the sun anymore. So it could be because Capricorn and Sagittarius are two um, temples that are right next to each other. And when, when you have a, two signs that are right next to each other on either side, or on either side of the opposition, that's like a blind spot. So for the sun, uh, now the sun is kind of like, hey, uh, hey, Jupiter, where's the um, <laughs> where's the the uh, the remote control to the TV or something like that? And Jupiter can't hear him, and so he's just shouting into the void. He doesn't know he's he's there anymore. So, uh, and this could be a very provide a very uncomfortable condition. Uh, now that is not necessarily true for Pisces. There is an aspect now by sextile from Jupiter to the Pisces moon. So what this means is that there may be a little bit more of a difficulty for Jupiter to provide the resources necessary to whatever is represented by Sagittarius in your chart. In this, in this particular chart, this is an Aries rising chart. It would be the ninth house of belief system and uh, of foreign travel, of um, finding meaning in life. So Jupiter may be, may be more difficult in this particular Aries rising chart to, to connect with the the, I don't know, the feeling of being connected with a, a, a teacher or a higher power or uh, whatever, however you find meaning. But it may be providing in this particular chart for the 12th house of uh, being able to uh, rest of um, perhaps an enforced rest <laughs> like uh, of, of self undoing. There may be some actions that are taken in this 10th house here of Capricorn that contribute to uh, potentially being pulled off course or something of that nature. Um, but wherever Pisces is in your chart, Jupiter will be able to provide, albeit from a, a much lower position uh, with Jupiter and Capricorn in its fall for wherever that uh, Piscean energy is. So this may be part of our conflict that happens with our first quarter phase. There may be something where you're trying to move something forward in the Piscean area of your chart, and it may be causing a conflict with the Sagittarian area of your chart, and you have to kind of reconcile those differences. Remember, the, the squares were of the nature of Mars. So there may be a necessary conflict that comes up with that, uh, where we have to kind of figure out how to resolve it through, uh, through these, this Jupiterian kind of influence through potentially through uh, being austere with our resources, through, through growing, through patient growth, through maybe um, downsizing the dream, so to speak, a little bit, 
to fit within our the the real practical things of our life. Sometimes when we get involved in a dream, uh, we come face to face with the the cost of it, the reality of it, and we have to kind of re envision it a little bit. And there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean that you failed. It means that you are paying attention to what your life is offering and that you are flowing with it rather than fighting it. There are times where you have to fight for what you want, um, but you have to just have an awareness of when that is necessary and when it isn't. And I think that what Jupiter is telling us now is that we really have to just be um, careful with our resources because they may not uh, be unlimited. Uh, This is where resources may come up against the limitations. Okay. So that is our first quarter moon that we're experiencing. The moon will also be making a conjunction with Neptune. So you can see this in this chart around 15 degrees of Pisces. The moon will be conjoining Neptune. Uh, Again, this is when when the moon has been conjoining Neptune in the past year or so here. uh, It may be giving us a little bit of a rose-colored glasses type of experience. It may give us a desire to connect with the transcendent, to connect with the dream or with the illusion. It may also be a time where we are just losing some steam, losing some energy. Uh, you know, Neptune has a dissolving quality. The, the moon, of course, was associated with the body, so maybe our body starts to fatigue. Maybe we're feeling a little bit more of a spiritual consciousness than a, excuse me, than a physical consciousness. Uh, and that could, you know, cause us to retreat into our imagination. Um, You know, Pisces being the feminine expression of Jupiter, maybe we're dreaming, but it's a little bit more internal. We're taking action towards uh, a fantasy rather than uh, taking action in the outside world, like Sagittarius would be more prone to do. So this may be a little bit of a daydreaming type of experience on Wednesday morning, or you may just feel a little bit fatigued from, uh, you know, all the things that are starting to be revealed that are going to become necessary with Jupiter's changing signs. The moon is going to be making a sextile to Saturn at 3.14 p.m., uh, getting, getting back in touch with reality. So maybe we'll get you know, a little bit of the fantasy, but then we're getting coming back down to Earth where we have a connection with Saturn, the, the lord of reality. <laughs> like, and then uh, uh, another favorable sextile to Pluto at 9.41 p.m. at 21 degrees of Pisces and Capricorn. So, you know, we've, we've been going through this with the moon whenever it makes aspects to the Capricorn area of our charts where we get the Saturnian limitation reality check. And that may force us to go deeper uh, and into the underworld. Maybe when we come into the limitations, that forces us to really examine our underlying motivations. Uh, it really, it forces us to transform the way that we're doing something. It forces us to come to terms with Uh, some sort of narrative that may be operating underneath the surface that we may not have been aware of and, you know, bring it to the light. Uh, And the moon is associated with light. So it's shining light on that, that particular kind of underworld type of experience, the structures, the underlying structures of our life. If we combine the meaning of Pluto and the meaning of Capricorn, like with being in that, in that Saturnian ruled sign. On Thursday the 5th, the moon is going to move into Aries at 2.44 p.m., continuing our first quarter phase. Uh, if we are working through the eightfold phase, we're going to be gaining light to the, to the new moon here. And the moon is going to be making a trine to Mercury uh, from Pisces to Scorpio at 3.15 a.m., and then a square to Jupiter at 4.09 p.m. Now, this is interesting because we have the first, uh, the first square from the moon to Jupiter in Capricorn. So if we see here, so this will bring uh, some new themes. Boop, there you go. So see how we've got this square between two cardinal signs now. Now before when we had squares with, with Jupiter, when the moon was moving through Pisces and uh, with Gemini, uh, I'm sorry, not with Gemini, Gemini is the opposition, with, with Virgo and with Pisces, that's when we got squares to Jupiter. Um, they were immutable signs, so that may have been a, a question of too many options, of, of maybe uh, needing to be flexible. Whereas this is a, a very different energy with with these signs, with these two planets being in cardinal or tropical signs, which are generally associated with the beginning of a season and initiating action. So this may be a, a conflict that comes up with um, exerting will in different areas of our charts and wanting to begin something but having to potentially make a compromise uh, between them. So here, 
we see uh, the moon in the very, um, you know, w uh, the sign of Aries that's Mars ruled, wanting to take action, wanting to exert the willpower, and Jupiter being in that very slow and patient and steady sign of Capricorn, we may see a, a conflict between uh, our personal desires to take action and to do it quickly and to maybe not think about the consequences, which is more associated with Aries, uh, and the slow, steady, patient, limitation area of Jupiter. So this is something we may be feeling on Thursday is we really want to do it, uh, and, but, but we've got to think about um, how it fits into the bigger picture, and, and there's this kind of conflict between speed and patience. All right, on Friday, 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 Friday. Oh. On Friday, December 6th, the moon will be in Aries uh, again, and then we're going to be seeing the moon making its square to Venus. So one of the things you can track with this, uh, this may be, again, this is going to be a, 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 another aspect that may be slightly difficult. Now, it may not be as difficult as it will be a little bit uh, further on in the weekend when the moon makes the square to Saturn um, because that is a malefic and Jupiter and Venus are benefic planets. There are some authors that say that squares to benefics still are generally good. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that the, that good won't come through some sort of conflict though. So it may be a little bit more difficult to come to whatever the good is but it still may be bringing something subjectively good into your life. Um, now, one way you can track this is not only are you looking at the Aries and Capricorn ruled area of your chart through whatever whole sign house that they fall into, uh, but you can also track whatever house that Jupiter and Venus rule um, that can also play a part in this um, story. So, for example, in our Taurus chart here that we have on the screen, Jupiter is responsible for the sixth house. I'm sorry, nope, 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 nope. Getting ahead of myself. Jupiter is responsible for the eighth house here of Sagittarius and the 11th house of Pisces. So resources of others and groups that we are part of, friendships. So that may be something that you find a conflict with through maybe a belief system through maybe a long distance travel, through some sort of uh, learning or, or teaching that you may be experiencing. So one p potential narrative that could happen with this, like say that you have some friends that you are uh, going on a trip with, but you are sharing a hotel, okay? If you're a tourist rising or you're sharing an accommodation or something like that, you're going on a long distance trip and you're, you're having to split the bill and there may be some sort of disagreement about it because this is a, a conflict about how you're splitting the bill. And, you know, it may not, it may not be, it may, it may be something that eventually gets resolved and something good comes out of it. Maybe like you figure out a better way to do it, right? Because it's a benefic square here. Um, but this is kind of like if I'm just kind of trying to extrapolate out how all of these things could come into uh, coordination with one another. That, that's the type of thing that we do with astrology is we take a look at where these planets are, what houses they're providing for, and what house they are actually acting within. So this is going to be the Jupiter square. And then when we look at the Venus square, you could take a look in the same chart and say, okay, then there might be a square between uh, the moon and Venus providing for the first house of self, of the body, of our identity, and the sixth house of Libra, of accidents, of daily habits, routines, of like work that we do that we may not get credit for or things like that. Potentially, you have something going on with your, let's say this individual had a trip they were taking and they needed to split the bill when we talked about those two things with a friend. Uh, and then they, you know, are having some sort of conflict with uh, maybe it's a health challenge that comes up. Maybe they get a new assignment at work or maybe something like that and they have some work that they have to do that affects their, their body or their health. Maybe it's associated with the law or government with Venus being in the ninth house uh, or some sort of higher, higher learning or higher education type of thing. Uh, maybe they you know, 
have to work through some sort of very important paper they're working on, something like that. But you could see how we're creating a story, connecting all of these things together. And it may be more, uh, it may be easier for Venus to provide for the first house being enshrined to it than to provide for the sixth house where it is in a square. Okay, see that? And this is all triggered by some sort of self undoing by the moon in the 12th house. Okay, which is also a square. So maybe you, you know, while you were planning the trip uh, to some foreign place, you forgot that you had some big project that you're working on and you really have to like buckle down and grind it out and through your, your I don't know, uh, inability to be responsible, you, you have to pull an all-nighter and it affects your health. So see what, this is one, you know, possibility some made up possibility for a Taurus ascendant, okay? Um, and then as we move forward through Saturday, then the moon hits Saturn. Dun, 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 okay? So you can see here, uh, if we go back a few hours here, whoops. If we go back a few hours, you'll see the perfection of the moon and Saturn at about 18 degrees, okay? And this one's not as fun. Not, not that the other ones were fun or whatever, but uh, this one could be a little bit more sticky, a little bit more dicey, um, because the moon is making contact with a malefic from a square. And when we have a planet aspecting a malefic from a square, generally that will bring things that are uh, things that we don't want. And squares are of the nature of Mars, so we have this conflict potentially with our limitations. Now I have a, a Libra rising chart here. So this could be some kind of limitation uh, with Saturn in this fourth house that is brought about and triggered by something in a partnership. And Saturn is gonna be providing for the fourth house of home and family and for the fifth house of creativity or children or things like that. So maybe there's some sort of conflict that comes up in this Libra rising chart that has to do with their children or where they live and maybe is triggered by some sort of partnership issue. Uh, so you could see that, that, that may be, there may be an argument or something with that. Um, so, you know, this is an exercise that you can do with your own chart. I'm, I'm doing this as an example so that you can go within your own natal chart and, and start experimenting with this. Now, of course, if you, if you want someone to do that work for you, uh, you know, you can set up a reading. I would be more than happy to go through your chart and go through these these aspects with you and, and discuss the things that you're going through with your life. Uh, I know it can be a lot to, to parse out. So uh, I am of course available for that. I do have a special running little shameless plug here from Thanksgiving where I was giving 10% off all of my readings until the full moon on the 12th. So if you want to get in on that, that'll be good for this entire week. Uh, just reach out with an email to me. I believe the code that I put up there was Turkey day. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So the other thing that we're experiencing whenever we have the square to Saturn is very shortly after we have the square to Pluto. All right. So now we're going to be seeing the square from the moon to Pluto. And instead of the harmonious sextile that we we're experiencing when, when the moon was in uh, Pisces, now there's a little bit more of a difficult experience with that when it's making contact with Pluto from the square of Aries. So I think over the weekend, it's just important to like see how your own personal desires fit into the bigger plan. Um, try not to get too fixated on, on your own subjective perspective and see if you can work through um, and compromise the, the greater vision that includes everyone with, with your own personal desire, because that may be something that comes up over the weekend. All right, let's look at Sunday. On Sunday, we have a few non-lunar aspects that are important and that are going to be uh, something that is building up throughout the entire week. So uh, first of all, the first thing that we're seeing is the moon is going to be moving into its exaltation in the sign of Taurus. So this is, a, this is an improvement for the moon. The moon is going to be getting out of that kind of sticky... Uh, squares, all those sticky squares with, excuse me, with, uh, with all the Capricorn planets and moving into a trine. So potentially we did all of the hard work and the heavy lifting necessary 
And now we're seeing the practical benefits of, of that uh, ability to, to move through that conflict and, and hopefully learn from it. Um, we're, we're moving into the waxing gibbous phase of the moon on Sunday, where instead of the first quarter conflict that we're experiencing, we are moving towards the, uh, we've moved past that hopefully, and now we're, we're analyzing and perfecting things uh, to the revealing stage of the, of the full moon. So this is a great time to kind of see if, if all your systems are working properly, um, if, if you have to, to kind of change up the, the appearance of something before it's revealed to the public, this is a great time to do that. Um, but the big aspect of the day, um, there's a couple, but the, the big one is the sun squaring Neptune. So we can see that the sun at 15 degrees of Sagittarius is squaring Pisces at 15 degrees, or Neptune at 15 degrees of Pisces right here. And this is a this is an aspect where we're going to be potentially um, experiencing a little bit of potentially self deception, escapism. Uh, maybe we are thinking of martyring ourselves for some kind of higher goal or higher purpose. Uh, remember, the sun has to do with our identity, with the illumination of the mind, the light of the mind, how we express ourselves. Uh, how we craft our identity. And when it comes in contact via a difficult aspect with Neptune, we may have some confusion over our identity. Maybe there is something where we are trying to become something, but we're getting a little bit discouraged in the process. Maybe we ha don't have a very accurate uh, uh, viewpoint of our, of our self-image. This is a time where we can really um, not have a very accurate view of of who we are potentially, or we may be envisioning uh, something that may not be uh, realistic too, as far as who we want to be and how we want to express that. So that's something that to watch out for. Um, this also could, you know, trigger some very um, some desires to connect with the divine. Uh, Neptune was a planet of transcendence and and a desire to transcend boundaries and dissolve the boundaries between the self and 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 God, so to speak, or the universe. So there may be some, some qualities where you're like, well, I'm willing to sacrifice some of the, my sense of self for uh, a connection with something with a higher power. And I, I, would, I would only encourage you to make sure that if you're going to uh, sacrifice or martyr yourself, that it is uh, something that is appropriate. A lot of the times we tend to deny ourselves for things that um, don't necessarily need to be denied, okay? We, we tend to sacrifice ourselves for unworthy goals every once in a while. And that, can, that could be something that could come up over the weekend that we really have to watch out for and be check in with, with you know, maybe somebody else and say, is, am I really, uh, is my, my self-image caught up in some sort of illusion or, dis, or delusion? Uh, am I sacrificing myself for something worthy? Or is this just a needless sacrifice or a martyrdom? So that's something that we may be experiencing very early in the morning on Sunday. The moon is going to be making a trine to Jupiter from Taurus uh, at about 5 a.m. at one degree here. So you can see that now it's going to be trining. So this is, this is an interesting aspect where we may be uh, able to bring something into form from the Taurus area of our chart, and it'll be having a positive support from that Jupiter that's in its own Deccan, uh, albeit in its fall from a, a much lower position. The moon will then make a conjunction with Uranus and Taurus, so this may also help to shake up our routine and bring us something unexpected in that Taurus-ruled area of our chart. This is going to be just echoing that Jupiter-Uranus uh, trine that, that where we may be uh, expanding into something good, um, but it may be through breaking free from something or, or liberation or from doing something in a very innovative way. So. If you have some good ideas about how to put the plan into action uh, at the end of the weekend, pay attention because it may, it may be outside of the norm, but ultimately it may bring you something positive uh, through, that, through that type of uh, movement. Uh, the last aspect of the day will be Venus at 15 degrees of Capricorn making a sextile to Neptune. So this is a positive aspect, uh, sextiles being of the nature of Venus herself. So this is a harmonizing aspect between Venus and Neptune, um, where we may be experiencing some kind of sacred love, uh, 
We may be having uh, some kind of devotional spirit. Uh, this also could potentially um, contribute to some codependence. So that is one thing to watch out for. There may be a little bit of confusion or idealization in our relationships too. Um, but this could be a, a good time to just have a nice, um, maybe a good, a nice date or watch a movie with, with your beloved or, you know, figure out if you have some kind of uh, positive thing happening in your uh, Capricorn ruled area of your chart that is acting in accordance with the Piscean area, ruled area of your chart. So this may be where we see some sort of um, beautification of those two areas of your chart, but it may be very, very idealized, okay? So don't get too caught up in the, in the beautiful vision, but every once in a while, it's nice to be able to uh, listen to a beautiful piece of music or see a beautiful film or go to an art gallery or something like that, or where we're, we really do feel a connection with something uh, higher than ourselves or, or outside of ourselves through, through the aesthetics. So this could be a time where you're listening to a piece of music and the hairs on your back of your neck start to stand up because of you feel the divinity within that expression and within that music. Or you see a painting and it just makes you realize something grander about your life where you get outside of that flow of time and you're within the, the, uh, the transcendent flow state. So this is something where that, those two things could be coming together quite nicely at the very end of the weekend on Sunday December 12th. The other cool thing about this week, uh, or this day in particular, I guess, I don't know if it's cool, but it's something we should look at. Um, here on Sunday, we see Jupiter going under the beams of the sun. Now, I'm going to unannotate this for a second. I'm going to show you what that means, because this is important. This is a, uh, oops, there it goes. This is going to be about 1 p.m. or so. My, my little annotation here, is it? Okay. So you can see now that, the, that Jupiter is within 15 degrees of the sun, which means that it is under the sun's beams, or it's going to basically disappear under the beams of the sun. It is an evening star. It's moving into its conjunction with the sun, its inferior conjunction. So it's going to be a Kazemi moment with Jupiter and the sun in, in I don't know, a couple weeks from now, maybe a month or so. Uh, I don't know the exact date on that, but it's, it's coming. Um, but this is a time where the Jupiter ruled area of our chart is kind of going behind the scenes. It is a weakening position for Jupiter because whenever something gets too close to the sun, it is said to be uh, weakened. It's like a planet that is taking or somebody who is taking to its sickbed, ready to be reborn or to be uh, revitalized. So we may get some kind of revitalization when we have the Jupiter coming in conjunction with the sun. Um, but th there may be some, some delays or some kind of behind the scenes work that needs to happen before that happens. And we may start to feel that on Sunday where, you know, this is where the moment where I think a lot of our hope or optimism may start to get a little bit dampened and we you know, a lot of the work that we're doing, a lot of the expansive work may start to happen very much behind some sort of curtain or behind the scenes where, you know, if, <clears throat> if we've decided the, the goal that we have and we've decided what it's going to take to do it, this may be the time where we're just grinding it out, right? Maybe, you know, we've set an exercise routine and we've figured out what gym we want to go to. We figured out the trainer we want to work with. And now it's time to just get to work. And you may not get the accolades that you need for it. You may not even see the results right away. This may be the, the beginning of the exercise routine where it's painful, right? Where you, you, you're out of shape and you have to start somewhere at the very bottom. And you keep, now, you, now it's time to grind it out. Now it's time to do the hard work and you may not get the rewards right away. You may still see the love handles. You may feel really sore. But if you stick with it, it's going to lead to a new start. It's going to lead to something, uh, some kind of, uh, you know, renewal when, when we see Jupiter coming into the heart of the sun in a few weeks. So I encourage you to, to, to do that hard work and don't get too frustrated if you don't see the, the external results of it because you are preparing yourself for that externalization um, by doing the necessary Saturnian work to make it a reality. All right. So that is the forecast for this week. 
thank you all for being patient. I'm sorry that I had to delay it for a day here. I was just feeling really burnt out. It was just a very an emotional. Um, it was an emotional few days. I my cat got really sick the day before Thanksgiving, and we took her to the took him to the vet and got some treatment, and then he wasn't really improving, and we had to, you know, kind of waited out until the vet was open the next day and we we're thinking about do we have to take him to the cat er which is three times as expensive as the vet and you know we ended up taking him to the vet on friday and he got the treatment that he needed and he, like i said he swallowed a piece of plastic uh a, like a big piece of plastic like if you have one of those chew toys that clean their teeth for cats don't buy it because they, they will bite it in half if you have a big cat and eat it and almost die um, so that's what happened with him. And luckily he did not have any more of it in his stomach and ended up, you know, just needing some time for the inflammation in the system to resolve itself. And he's doing better now. So we're happy, but it really just, uh, put a real damper on the holiday. We canceled all our travel plans and to take care of him and make sure that he was convalescing appropriately and doing okay. And, um, I just needed a day to recover and get my work done without, worrying about my fur baby, <laughs> you know, our, I have two cats and they're definitely um, furry children. And um, being a little bit of a hermit that works from home, they're, they're my buddies and uh, um, they're important to me. So I, I'm sure many of you have pets that are family that you feel the same way. So I appreciate your patience with all of that and, and hope that you had a good holiday and, and hope that you'll find some benefit, uh, albeit one day later with the, the forecast here. Um, just briefly looking ahead to the 9th through the 15th, Mercury moves into Sagittarius. Uh, it's exile on Monday the 9th. Uh, we're going to see a conjunction of the Venus and Saturn on Wednesday the 11th, moving up to a full moon in Gemini on the 12th. Uh, a couple other aspects, we're going to see the, the trine of Mars and Neptune on Friday the 13th. Venus is going to be conjoining Pluto on Friday as well. And then we have our big Jupiter Uranus trine on Sunday the 15th. So that's what's coming up in the weeks ahead. Um, if you're looking even further down the road, we've got a full, uh, an eclipse happening on the 26th in the sign of Capricorn, new moon eclipse, which is going to set off a, a larger six-month chapter marker type of cycle uh, that's going to culminate at another eclipse in the beginning of January with that Saturn-Pluto conjunction everyone's been talking about forever. So some big changes towards the, the end of the month. So we're going to get starting to get the, the new uh, impulses now for the bigger changes that are happening throughout the new year. So anyway, that's been your, uh, your forecast for the week. I hope that you all are doing well. If you like these videos, make sure that you're subscribing uh, and sharing with your friends. And if you want to make a donation, I have some links down there too. That helps me continue to make the videos. And I appreciate all of your help and support. And we will see you the next time. Take care. Peace.